We're going to go right to the overview that I'm going to give, take a couple of minutes. I put this together three years ago. I delivered it at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation to their staff there. I haven't updated it since, so the numbers might be out of date, probably are out of date, but the way to think about it, the analytical framework remains the same. So there was a report showing that uh, Chinese hospitals are performing six, 60,000 to 100,000 transplants for a year, far above the official government, government figure, Chinese government figure of 10,000 per year. And a quote from the, that report, a meticulous examination of the transplant programs of hundreds of hospitals in China, and that's one point to understand about this subject, subject, it's not just a few transplants here and there, it's industrial scale involving hundreds of hospitals in China, drawing on media reports, official propaganda, medical journals, hospital websites, and a vast amount of deleted websites found in archive. The report analyzes hospital revenue, bed counts, bed utilization rates, surgical personnel, training programs, state funding, and more. And then the report concluded about the up to 100,000 transplants per year. Quote, in 2006, Canadian researcher David Matus, human rights attorney, and David Kilgore, who's on the, in the, one of our speakers tonight, former Canadian Secretary of State for Asia Pacific, conducted an independent investigation into allegations of organ, organ harvesting from Falun Gong prisoners in China and concluded that Falun Gong practitioners are being killed for their organs and that that was highly probable. In another report, researcher and journalist Ethan Gutman published findings that Chinese security agencies began harvesting organs from members of the predominantly Muslim Uyghur ethnic minority group in the 1990s. It's making the news now, but this goes back to the 1990s, including from Uyghur political prisoners. Prisoners of conscience, including Uyghurs, Tibetans, practitioners of the Buddhist school practice Falun, Falun Gong, and potentially house Christians are detained in Chinese labor camps, deprived of liberty, and subject to summary execution for their organs. Now, the variety of types of evidence about which we're going to hear more from uh, David Kilgore about, uh, the variety is, is impressive. In addition to the above sources I mentioned, the evidence includes a Chinese transplant surgeon who admits he killed people for their organs, admissions about short wait times, which are impossibly short wait times compared to the rest of the world, and good health of the organs made during calls. They actually called the transplant hospitals and talked about transplants. Good health is important. Prisoners have hepatitis while Falun, while Falun Gong are healthy. China did not even have a national organ transplantation system, an official one, until just a few years ago. Traditional Chinese taboos reduced numbers signing up for the country's relatively new organ transplant registry. Now, back to industrial scale, this activity nets China up to $9 billion a year, and the figure has probably grown since I put this together. Matus and Kilgore have implicated state and party entities in illicit organ harvesting, including domestic security agencies and military hospitals. That's another thing to uh, point to note here, the involvement of the People's Liberation Army, Army in this activity. Wang Jiefu, director of the China Organ Donation Committee, announced in December 2014 that China would end the practice of organ harvesting from executed prisoners by 2015, but he did not directly address organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience. Now, the Chinese are masters of propaganda. They keep saying that they've stopped this practice from executed prisoners, but they, uh, the allegations continue that they are still extracting, killing uh, prisoners of conscience for their organs. So there is a distinction between uh, prisoners who are executed and prisoners of conscience. And in 2016, the ha U.S. House of Representatives called on the People's Republic of China in a resolution to allow a credible, transparent, and independent investigation into organ transplant abuse. And that is the last thing the Chinese governor, government would want to do. And the bottom line is China's numbers don't add up. Their explanations don't add up. The, uh, an independent investigation is needed. And with that as background, we're going to go right to Jennifer Zung, and I'm going to introduce her. Jennifer is a valued member of the Anti-Communism Action Team Speakers Bureau. She's been with us for a few years now, and she was 
uh, born in Sichuan province in 1966, that's in China. She was arrested four times and held as a prisoner of conscience in a labor camp for a year. In the camp, she was physically and mentally abused and subjected to attempted brainwashing and electroshock treatment. She fled China in 2001 for Australia, wrote a book about her experiences, and eventually settled in the United States. There's also a documentary about her life. You can find her current work, her current reporting on China, where she breaks many original stories, and her other work at jenniferzungblog.com, on YouTube, and on Subscribestar. And with that, uh, Jennifer, take away. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for Chris and uh, hello everyone. I think I'll jump right uh, on the day when we were transferred from the detention center to the labor camp. That was on the June the 1st, 2000. Uh, that was at the uh, relatively beginning stage of the crackdown of Falun Gong. And I remember very clearly on our way from the detention center to the labor camp, we were taken uh, to a clinic first to conduct a thorough uh, physical checkups. And there was a doctor uh, integrating everybody regarding our medical history. And I honestly told him that I had hepatitis C before I practiced Falun Gong because that was the case. And I remember this especially because I uh, felt like happy uh, uh, at that time because I think I could uh, somehow let them know that I recovered from my hepatitis C um, after I practiced in Falun Gong. Although we were cracked down by the government, uh, we uh, still want to convey uh, the beauty of the Falun Gong or Falun Dafa to whoever we met on, on the way. So that was the first physical checkup we encountered on the day when we were transferred to the neighbor camp on June 1st, uh, 2000. And then in, when we were already inside the labor camp, maybe probably after one or two months, I didn't, I don't remember on which day exactly, there was suddenly a big, big bus uh, arriving at the labor camp. And everyone, actually, they, they uh, handcuffed every two of us together. So one pair of handcuffs to two persons. So they handcuffed uh, us two uh, in a pair of handcuffs and uh, pushed us inside of this bus. And, uh, and they act, uh, I remember very clearly they actually put curtains on the windows of the bus. So we're, we were uh, all... Uh, uh, you can say one on top of another inside of the bus. So all these seats were filled and I remember I was squatting between the little space of two rows because there were no enough seats for every one of us. So the extra people either stood on in the corridor or between the uh, seats of the, of the two rows. So I buried my head on the, on the knees of the person who were sitting and the bus is a uh, big blank boxes because all the curtains were covered by by some kind of clothing so in that kind of terrifying and it was so hot it's hot summer and in that kind of terrifying uh, situation we were uh, bused to a hospital not very long maybe pro probably 30 minutes drive from the labor camp. And there we were uh, given another very rough physical checkups at this time, including x-ray. And then we were taken to back to the labor camp under the same kind of terrifying situation, a big black box, uh, us, uh, taken us to the hospital and then take, take, took us back. And then maybe uh, one after another month or so, uh, we were taken this time just a few, maybe two or three together to a very small clinic inside the labor camp, just between the big gate, and to have our blood taken. Uh, so the, the police just uh, 
call us in in the courage of the building, call our name and whatever name we're called, we need to follow the police to go to that clinic and, and have our blood taken. We were never told why they take our blood and we were never show the result of the physical checkups and why we on the one hand they torture us to death and on the other hand they uh, give us you know this but spend so many so much money so much effort in checking our physical status repeatedly when i was uh, in the camp that was from 2000 and 2001 i do remember the police once threatened us if you do not give up Falun Gong, if you do not transform or reform, you will be sent to the uh, very far area in the west north of China, and as soon as you are there, never dream of coming back home again. But at that time, I thought it was just a, a threat, uh, so I didn't take it seriously. Only after many, many years in 2006, when I was already in Sydney, when I read the first report about the organ harvesting affair, and when I recall what happened to me and to the others inside the camp, especially we had a very strict regulations in the camp, uh, inmates were not allowed to exchange contact information, and when we were when we were released, we were searched so thoroughly so to ensure that we didn't bring any single little piece of paper uh, with us of any information. So when we were in the camp, we didn't think why they had such, a, such kind of regulation, but later on I recall this and I found when someone disappeared from the camp, we would assume he or she got released, but we really had no way to verify this because after I was released, I couldn't get contact with any other fellow inmates in the inner camp. So I actually didn't know the whereabouts of whoever was once there or who was still in there, who released before me who, or who disappeared after me. So there is no way to verify this. So apart from this, uh, I think, terrifying experience of what become the potential uh, donor or so-called donor of the organ harvesting, other two parts of the labor camp is one, endless slave labor. Every day we got up from 5.30 and we work up till midnight and sometimes we work overnight so that our products can catch up the train for the next day. And another part is, of course, endless torture because the only purpose the police told us to send us there is to get us reformed. So the they torture was just unbelievably cruel. I saw people uh, beaten into insanity. She lost her mind. I saw people shocked. I myself was shocked. And uh, there were people who were tortured to death in the camp or, or as well as in the labor camp. So that's the, the torture happened every day. So there's no reason or rationale why on the one other hand they torture us to death and then on the other hand we were given physical checkups repeatedly. So uh, only after many, many years because I think no normal human being would be able to imagine that this kind of thing could happen to any other fellow human being. So only after many years when I read the report and uh, I, when I read many, many reports did I realize what a narrow escape I had, uh, probably because I told the doctor that I had hepatitis C, that I wasn't uh, being taken for the organs. So that's my personal experience. Uh, I hope maybe um, you can spread what you here today as many people as possible because we don't know how many people have been already killed by this organ transplant, you know, genocide or whatever. I don't know how to uh, describe it. So I think I'm already used up my 10 minutes. So I'll maybe give back to my, the mic to David. Former lawyer and Canadian politician. 
David served as a Crown Attorney in Northern Alberta, a Canadian Cabinet Minister, and for 27 years as a member of Canada's Parliament. For his organ harvesting work, David Kilgore was co-recipient of the 2009 Human Rights Award from the German-based International Society for Human Rights and was nominated for the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize. David is a member of the International Advisory Committee of the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China, otherwise known as ETAC. And with that introduction, uh, David's going to tell us about the constellation of evidence supporting the conclusion that China is engaged in criminal forest organ harvesting. David, the floor is yours. It's such a serious subject that um, I, I thought I might just pick up on what Jennifer said to try to, before I go into evidence and so on. Uh, what, what you said, Jennifer, it, we have talked to many people who've gone through similar processes who, like yourself, managed to get out of the system for various reasons, such as yours. And the way it works is that let's let's pick on Chris as a, an example. If Chris wants a new liver or heart or, or vital organ, and he's got enough money, the, the organs are very expensive. Then the prices vary, but uh, but they are very expensive. If he can come up with the money to a broker, perhaps a broker in New York, and there were brokers in New York, I'm quite sure of this. He would then fly to Shanghai to the number one people's hospital in Shanghai being from coming from the States. He would be given a bed. Uh, somebody would come and talk to him. They'd take a blood sample, a tissue sample from him. They'd then go on their computers, and it goes back to what you were saying, they'd find who was a match for him out in one of their many, many work camps, forced labor camps. <clears throat> Supposing you and Chris were a match, you would be taken out of your dormitory at night, which you know so well, You'd be taken to an operating room, given some uh, uh, minor anesthetic. It would vary sometimes what it was. You'd be, uh, your vital organs would be taken out, out of your body. You'd be, of course, be dead. Um, and then his ki kidney or liver or whatever it was would be flown to uh, Shanghai in the uh, People's Liberation Army aircraft. Uh, there was a, they had to do it quickly because the organs won't last. To, uh, very long, and he would he would have a, a kidney or liver put into his body, and he'd fly back to New York with a new kidney or liver. Probably he'd be told he got it from a uh, it was a voluntary donation if it was after 2015. But the reality was, as you said, it was from some prisoner of conscience who had been convicted in all likelihood of nothing, and was just being killed so that the the pilots of the aircraft, the, the surgeons, the the, the, the uh, nurses, the uh, everybody involved, the broker could make a huge amount of money. Uh, Chris mentioned nine billion. I, I'm sure it's gone up since then, but we uh, it was certainly billions of dollars. The the made was made out of this grotesque uh, commerce each year and, and continues to be made. I'll go into some of the evidence because I know this what I've just said and you've said may sound sound difficult for some people to um, to believe. Yes, it's very important to stress that there, among about 200 countries today, there's only one, the People's Republic of China, where the uh, where the uh, organ harvesting is run by the government and the state rather than by uh, unethical surgeons in the back alleys. Uh, in China, as you, I'm sure, all gather now, the system is run by the government for the benefit of the government and the people who do the operations. Um, it's... Uh, in mid 2006, as you mentioned, Chris, David Matus and I were as volunteers, did an independent investigation into these claims that these terrible things were happening to Falun Gong practitioners. Um, we uh, published two reports and uh, the Second Republic, I think, report is available in something like 60 languages. It was, it was translated into many languages. And we did a, a book entitled Bloody Harvest in 2009. We concluded, to our horror, of course, that since 2001, the Beijing uh, party state had directed a network of forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience, like Jennifer, for example, if she had been killed for her organs, primarily Falun Gong practitioners. They were then sold um, to wealthy recipients, as I was mentioning, and, um, and foreign organ tourists. Specifically, we concluded that from 
18 kinds of uh, evidence. And I, I was a prosecutor for almost 10 years, uh, as you mentioned, I guess, Chris. So I should know something about evidence, and certainly David Maitis does, does too. But beyond any doubt, between the years 2001 and 2005, 41,500 organs were, were sourced from Falun Gong prisoners of conscience, whose bodies were then incinerated or cremated. Canada's uh, much-loved rabbi emeritus, Dr. Reuven Bulkin, and there was, a, by the way, there was a tribute for him about an hour ago uh, here in, in Ottawa. He, he died recently, tragically. Um, he, he said this, and he, uh, quote, this is murder, brutal murder, taking organs from the bodies of live people, even though there was irrefutable evidence that this was happening, the Chinese authorities denied it. They are liars as well as murderers, close quote. Dr. Bulka is, is one of the most respected Canadians until his death a few weeks ago, uh, or I'm sorry, about a month ago in, in our entire country. Ethan Gutman, author of the uh, the Slaughter, which came out in 2014, spent seven years researching this, this, this file. He, uh, he put the persecution of the Falun Gong, Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Christian communities in China in context. He, uh, he explains how he arrived at his best estimate that organs from 65,000 Falun Gong and two to 4,000 Uyghurs, Tibetans, and Christians were pillaged in the 2000-2008 period. <clears throat> Matus, Gutman, and I released an update in 2016. You can get it, by the way, on the website. Simply go to davidkilgore.com and you'll see it. It's near the top. You can get, uh, you can access the whole, the whole report up there, along with a, a lot of other stuff. It provided a careful examination, and you, you quote Chris. You mentioned some of this in your intro um, of the transplant of the transplant program of the hundreds of hospitals across China, drawing on on medical journals, hospital websites, and debated and deleted websites um, found in archives. We concluded cautiously, the three of us, that over two decades, the party state has directed a network of organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience primarily Falun Gong since 2001. Our findings helped the US Congress and the European Parliament to pass nearly identical resolutions condemning the Chinese state for the harvesting of prisoners of conscience. Organ pillaging from Uyghurs, as I'm sure you all know, has in fact uh, preceded that from Falun Gong. Dr. Inver Toti, a Uyghur, has detailed how in 1995, as a, as a general surgeon in the Urumqi capital of Xinjiang, he, he was sent to an execution ground to remove a kidneys and liver from a living prisoner. In 2019, Toti uh, publicized a photograph of the, it's called the Human Organ Transplantation uh, Path at the Urumqi airport in Xinjiang, which expedited the transfer of organs to global recipients. Um, Xi Jinping himself has been quoted saying bizarrely that Uyghurs should be shown, quote, absolutely no mercy. Can you imagine? That's the kind of mental mentality that exists in uh, Xinjiang today. The independent uh, tribunal into forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience uh, uh, was instituted by the International Coalition, which you mentioned, Chris, in the UK. It heard witnesses on the persecution of Falun Gong members of, in China and the harvesting of, of organs to determine whether or not a criminal offense had been committed by the PRC government. Based on the 2019 independent China tribunal findings, um, we learned that the Beijing CCP authorities are still at it. 90,000 transplants a year, coupled with a waiting time of just a few weeks and the assurance of a backup organ should the original organ fail, comes to mind one man we talked to who 
four times they had to brought him a kidney and three of the, the first three kidneys they brought him didn't work so they brought him a fourth and finally it, it, it worked but the point of course is, is that four innocent human beings died so that he could get a, a kidney a kidney that works and we in fact uh, talk to him i won't tell you what country he lives in I don't think that helps um, uh, that's the reality of china it can only be explained as resulting from the murders of readily available prisoners, Falun Gong, Tibetans, Uyghur Muslims, and Christians. In delivering the unanimous judgment of the tribunal, Sir Jeffrey Nice, who was, who was active in the, in the war crimes tribunals, stressed the independence of his tribunal and its reluctance to infer the Chinese government complicity on the basis of its unwillingness to uh, engage in the proceedings. Despite silence from Beijing and its disinclination to defend the ro its role in the organ commerce, the tribunal determined that there was enough evidence to reach a, a damning verdict. Short waiting times for organs promised by PRC doctors and hospitals, the number of transplant operations performed, which far outnumbered the, the, the government and hospital statistics for voluntary donations, and a, quote, massive infrastructure development of facilities and medical personnel for organ transplant operations. Even before the, uh, the voluntary donation scheme was, was, was planned, were some of the conclusions that, uh, which when combined with everything else, uh, uh, forced, convinced us that forced organ harvesting was committed for years throughout China and convinced the, the tribunal, I hasten to say. The tribunal, concluded that Falun Gong practitioners were the primary victims. But since 2017, a, a comprehensive DNA collection of every man, woman, and child from Xinjiang, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the East Turkestan part of China, uh, from the Uyghur community in China has created a large pool of potential donors from which evidence of harvesting might later emerge. And the, Commission in, 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 China, in Britain is looking at that right now. The incarceration since 2017 of up to 3 million Uyghurs in concentration camps has added to the, to the concern that has become a particularly vulnerable group. Tribunal summary judgment states that, quote, it has had no evidence that the significant infrastructure associated with China's transportation industry has been dismantled. In the absence of a satisfied explanation as to the source of readily available organs, uh, the, the tribunal concluded that uh, forced organ harvesting continues until today, close quote. So I'm just, I'm just about finished. Uh, exponential increases in organ transplantation in the PRC have combined with inexplicable um, misrepresentation in the availability of voluntary donors, since executed prisoners have ceased officially being a source of organs in 2014, the number of transplants continued to rise. The tribunal ass assessing the anomalous data provided by the PRC became convinced that the government, uh, its official statistics had been falsified, taking as credible that between 60 and 90,000 transplant operations are carried on each year the number of official eligible donors in 2017 stood at about 5,100. The tribunal concluded that there was an incomprehensible gap le leading to the conclusion that, quote, there must have existed another source of, or other sources of tissue type organs. The stark deduction was that, quote, there must have existed a body of donors unidentified in the PRC uh, material. The tribunal was unanimous, I think believe there were nine people on the tribunal, in, in declaring it a crime against humanity. Um, now this is interesting. Responding to the tribunal's uh, final judgment, Dr. John Chisholm, who's the British Medical Association Medical Ethics Committee chair, stated, quote, the practice of forced organ harvesting represents a gross and continuing violation of a series of inalienable fundamental human rights, including the right to life, and in some cases, the right to free freedom from torture or from cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Any involvement, he went on, 
a physician's enforced or harvesting or, or, or of organs is therefore unlawful, unethical, and in contravention of the professional uh, professional uh, codes set down by the World Medical Association. The primary duty of all physicians is to promote the, the well-being of their patients. The first and foremost is to ensure they do no harm, close quote. The British Medical Association called on the People's Republic of China to, quote, facilitate a thorough independent investigation into forced organ harvesting and to protect physicians' core professional obligations by ensuring that physicians are never involved in such practices, close quote. So the UK tribunal concluded that by calling on government and individuals, activists and motivated politicians to, to decide for themselves whether crimes have been committed in the face of the findings and quote, do whatever they might think is their duty and I hope this applies to all of you as well. In the face of any revealed wickedness of the kind shown in any finding that forced organ harvesting has happened or is continuing to happen in the PRC. So in conclusion, uh, as all of you I'm sure know, Beijing doesn't hesitate to use trade and business incentives to further silence weak governments, nor does it hesitate to continue to undermine our Western democracies and values to advance what I would, as I said earlier, are, are fascist objectives. Um, the US and all responsible governments must take every opportunity to condemn publicly the Beijing regime over its ongoing persecution of prisoners of conscience. The entire international community should join the, uh, the rest of us, to, or should join those countries, and there are about 10 of them that have I put a travel ban on, on China-bound transplants uh, surgery. Any deal with China on any matter must include an insistence that the barbaric practice, this barbaric practice stop immediately, coupled with a, with a mechanism whereby such stoppages can be verified. The United States and Canada and of course all the responsible international community should apply its Magnitsky laws where they exist and have and other targeted sanctions against any Chinese government official known to be identified in the persecution of organ harvesting. And if we and other democracies uh, showed more commitment to our core values, this despicable commerce might, uh, would, would end, I believe, more quickly. And I'm convinced it's going to end because I think we're going to continue to put more and more pressure on the, the government of China. That's probably a good place to, to, to stop. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now I'm going to tell you about the Stopped Forced Organ Harvesting Act of 2021. These are identical bills that have been introduced in the current session of Congress in the Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. H.R. 1592 has a, uh, it was introduced by Representative Chris Smith. There are 19 co-sponsors, 17 Republicans and two Democrats. It's billed as bipartisan legislation. S602 uh, has one co-sponsor and it was introduced by Senator Tom Cotton and we'll call this whole, um, whole uh, exercise the Cotton Bill for a shorthand. Some provisions are directed at just organ trafficking. Uh, organ trafficking defined like, oh, there's a poor farmer in Pakistan and, and he sells a kidney for cash. So some of the provisions are directed towards that, which is to be distinguished from forced organ harvesting, which is killing human beings for their organs and extracting their organs uh, while they're uh, freshly dead. Okay, so in the Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Act, the Cotton Bill uh, authorizes the Secretary of State to revoke or deny passports. The State Department is supposed to report to Congress about organ trafficking and organ harvesting. Countries shall be ranked as having low, intermediate, or high levels of concern for organ trafficking and organ harvesting. The State Department shall report to Congress on U.S. medical and educational institutions that train organ transplant surgeons from countries of high concern. There is a ban in the bill, uh, proposed in the bill, on exports to entities shown to be involved in organ trafficking or harvesting. Sanctions can be imposed on individuals and entities in countries of high concern for facilitating organ trafficking or harvesting. 
sanctions include blocking property ownership and entry visas in the United States. And then there are civil and criminal penalties for violating the act. Now, the uh, international coalition I mentioned earlier put together a coalition letter, and I'm going to bring it up on the screen now. Okay, this is the coalition letter. It was put in final form in, on June 10th, 2021. There are some 70 signatories, including one I brought on, the American Association for Physicians and Surgeons. Then there are a number of other signatories, signatories including the International Coalition right here, um, there's, uh, Uyghur groups, um, and such a, a number of Vietnamese associations. Um, okay. But one part I wanted to get to is on page three. This is action you can take. Um, they're looking for more co-sponsors for the bills in the House and the Senate. And so your support and passage of this legislation will ensure that the United States is combating and not complicit in the heinous practice of forced organ harvesting. So for to co-sponsor the bill or for more information, there's some contact information given in this letter. Uh, there, a person in Senator Tom Cotton's office and a person in uh, Chris Smith's office. So there are the email addresses there if you'd like to um, uh, talk to them about uh, getting your representative in Congress to co-sponsor the bill. Uh, the next thing I'd like to tell you about this legislation, um, uh, also another thing you can do is there's a petition, and I'm going to bring that up on the screen now. Uh, let's see, here we go. All right, on the ACAT website, Spider and the Fly, on the homepage, the, at the very top of the homepage, there's a link to the petition, Support the U.S. Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Bill of 2021. And I'm going to click on this link. It'll take you to the petition page, and you can see... Uh, it's covered up on my screen, but there's uh, some thousands of, of signers already, and that's another thing you can do to support this bill. So uh, talk to your representative about co-sponsorship, um, and uh, you can also send in your own support letters from your groups, and you can also sign this petition to support the cotton bill. I do track the news on organ harvesting. We have a separate or organ harvesting page and there are suggestions on there about action steps you can take uh, US legislation more action steps links to the major reports and videos um, here's a picture of uh, Jennifer and uh, David Kilgore David Matus and Ethan Gutman who was also mentioned here tonight um, then the news, which we last updated earlier this month, uh, I just mentioned the top one, a former police officer in China uh, recounts witnessing industrialized organ harvesting in China. So the evidence continues to pile up. Um, I see a question, where is the petition again, please? That's back on the homepage of the ACAT website. The very top of the homepage, there's a link to the petition. Uh, first question goes to Jennifer. Uh, you mentioned that you went through uh, many checkups uh, while you were a prisoner of conscience in China. What was the chatter? What did your fellow prisoners think uh, all these checkups were for? Did you have any idea what was going on? No, not at all. Because that was in 2000 and 2001. Nobody, I think, on that stage has... Uh, had ever heard about about this practice so uh, we and every day our schedule was so tight we were so um, tired and we uh, all were all our minds were on um, either how I could uh, finish my quota today or how can I hold for another day without being transformed by them so I really didn't have the ability or to think about why they are, uh, like, you, like I said, told us on the one hand to this and on the other hand give us repeated checkups. I think no human, normal human being with a normal thinking would ever imagine what this sinister um, 
purpose for those uh, checkups were. Otherwise, would be we would have been terrified to death. But at that time, we didn't know anything, so we passively uh, go through whatever they told they told us to do. So that's the situation in the labor camp. Jennifer, I, I think you may have been one of the people who told David Madison and I. And as you know, we traveled to about 50 countries talking to people like yourself who managed to get out of these horrible camps. Uh, a number of them, and I think you were one of them, told us that the only people examined in the camps were Falun Gong practitioners by these doctors. And the medical examinations were really just to see how good your organs were, although perhaps some people didn't realize that at the time. Was that your experience that only the Falun Gong were examined and not other prisoners? Uh, in in, la in my labor camp, by the way, it is the Beijing female labor camp. Uh, when we were first there on the day I mentioned, we were taken to a clinic. On that day, there were 24 of us, but 20 out of 24 were all Falun Gong practitioners. And then later on in the in the camp, they the image, the number of images developed from about 100 to nearly 1,000 in just several minutes. And 90% of the images there, when I was there, were Falun Gong practitioners. So whenever what they did to us, because 95 were Falun Gong practitioners anyway. So I, yeah, I heard other Falun Gong practitioners and remember very clearly that only Falun Gong practitioners were checked. But in my case, because 95 of, of the image prisoners in the camp were Falun Gong practitioners anyway, so I didn't, you know, remember exactly whether they only took Falun Gong practitioners or everybody. Okay, the next questions are for David. Uh, David, is there any evidence that the, you mentioned there are up to 3 million Uyghurs in camps today in Xinjiang province. Is there even any evidence that they are being tissue typed for their organs? Oh yes, I, I um, actually uh, um, one of the Uyghur community at, uh, in the United States has pointed out that everybody of, of uh, Muslim faith has been DNA tested in uh, in Xinjiang, but they are the only ones who've been tested. As I'm sure you all know, there's quite a large community now in that part of China that is not uh, is not Uyghur, so it's only the Uyghurs that get tested for their DNA. Uh, in, the, in these camps and, and, and other people don't. It's a bit like Falun Gong, as we were talking about a minute ago. And that's, I think it's obviously, and I think that's what the, uh, the Jeffrey Nice Commission is going to say when they report, I guess, in five months or six months, is that it's obvious that, that as with Falun Gong, the Uyghurs are being tested to see how, how good they would be as organ so-called donors. But as, as everybody knows, there's nothing, you know, these aren't, Donated organs at all? They're, they're people who are murdered, and then their organs are taken from their from their bodies, or they're they are murdered in the process of taking them from their bodies. I, sorry, I should have put that more precisely. And the next question is: uh, China has mounted in recent years a, a a very aggressive propaganda campaign about this whole issue. And just for example, oh, last month I saw that they had arrested some do some random doctor and charged him with um, with organ harvesting, uh, and that was a crime against Chinese law, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they, they, uh, they will go out there and, and tout the, the virtues, extol the virtues of their, their official transplant system. And yeah. tell us a little bit about... Yeah, I saw that report too, Chris, that, and it was, it was com really it was comical. And you know who's put it better than anybody is that wonderful man, Huawei Wei, I guess now lives in London, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and he's the one who designed the uh, 2008 Beijing uh, Stadium. And he's a, uh, please try to look him up. Huawei Wei, I'm sure Jennifer knows all about him. And he said something that I think applies to what you're just speaking about, which is that the, uh, the Communist Party of China is now so, so ethically poor ethically depra deprived, if you like, and so intellectually stupid, I think that was the term, or stupid, or, or <laughs> that they're incapable of debating with anybody. They're, incap they're incapable of de de debating with anybody, uh, any serious person from anywhere, because of the fact that they're, uh, they've gone so low. And so this thing about arresting somebody 
a doctor and saying, well, we're going to charge him for doing this. When you have on the other side, you have a mountain of evidence showing that they, they're continuing to run an industry based on killing their own prisoners of conscience, shows you how stupid they are and how stupid they think we are if we're going to accept this thing. Ethan Gutman puts it very well. The intellectual discussion of this topic is, uh, is long, long, long over and, and uh, they've lost it. Let me give you all one perhaps humorous example. When David Mavis and I put out our interim report back in 2006, we, we, made a, we made a couple of mistakes on the maps. We put a city in the wrong province. I think we did this twice. And we had a, whatever it was, a 90 page report. And these, <laughs> these people in the Communist Party in China, the only thing they could pick to, to challenge in our report was the fact that we got two cities in the wrong states. And so they made a big deal out of the fact that, uh, that uh, we had made these mistakes. And of course, we immediately admitted we had made these mistakes. But in terms of the substance, in terms of murdering citizens for their organs, we did not make mistakes. And if we ever did, we corrected them immediately. So uh, we're dealing with people whose uh, intellectual and ethical principles are so low now that it's, they, they, they do things almost every day. And look what they're doing at the Olympics who were watching that carefully to, to see that they're just uh, they're just uh, propagandists. It's another reason why everybody who's watching this should please join all of us who are trying to get the the Olympics for for 2022 either moved uh, moved or or cancelled. And uh, I was horrified to see today that uh, Coca Cola, one of the sponsors of the Olympics, doesn't seem to think there's anything going wrong in in uh, in China that uh, he, he's concerned about. You, you can get his uh, evidence. I'm sure you can get it on under Google very quickly. It's a, uh, it's it's very sad. And it's uh, Coca-Cola is not the only one. Okay, we have a question from the floor for Jennifer. Why isn't this subject covered by Newsmax, One American News, Fox, etc.? I think uh, maybe Fox did something uh, before, but that was maybe several months ago. I don't quite uh, understand about Newsmax and, uh, and other channels. Yes, I am also very uh, disappointed that this issue is not covered all the time because this problem is going on, but uh, the international media, I don't know why they didn't keep uh, pick up this story, and I, I also hope I can have a have an answer. Maybe they don't want to upset uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party, or maybe they think this is a little bit risky or whatever. But I think right now nobody would um, deny these things happen. And I, I want to make up something for this so-called donation system in China, which they claim they have started in 2015 something. What I know is, number one, this, this system is, is all fake. Uh, in, independent investigators actually did investigation that those uh, systems didn't work at all. They just put some fake numbers there. And it's inside Chinese culture and people are very reluctant to donate their body. And even if for their, for their fake numbers, if you do the math with their fake numbers, they say, oh, we've, have, we've signed up so many volunteers and every year they have so many transplant, transplants. So you, you, if you compare that, that sort of number, we call it convert number, we say, same issue in the U.S. So in China, the, the number is hundreds times of higher. Say so in, in America, you need say 10,000 donor, registered donors to result in maybe a one a transplant, but in China you only need one hundred or something. That it's it's in hundreds of times of difference. So that system is a totally, I think, a fake one. And I I do think we don't we need to be very careful, don't to be taken in by any of their lies and just repeat what they are saying. Everything the CCP is saying is fake. So that I want really want to make this point. I did some math, and it's all fake. Even according to their own numbers, nothing can count up to them. 
Chris, that photograph you showed of Jennifer, Ethan, and myself with some others, that was actually at the BBC headquarters right after uh, the Jeffrey Nice group had reported. And uh, we all went down to BBC expecting to be interviewed. And uh, to our horror, we discovered, as Jennifer, I think, will agree, that they, the journalists at the BBC had been told they could not interview us on this subject. Uh, now, yeah, that's the one right there. So we all, we all went away wondering what happened to the backbone of the BBC on this issue. But let me use that to make the point that the Australian Broadcasting Corporation has been extremely good about reporting on this issue. And when Ethan and I went there, well, we, I guess way back in 2007, uh, we were put on ABC, uh, I think two or three nights in a row. And we, they were very, very helpful to get, for us in getting out this message. The result was that uh, later in about 2011 or something, I was back in, uh, in uh, Australia and I talked to one of the deputy ministers of health there. She told me that uh, nobody went to Australia for organs now because the people of Australia, thanks to their media, knew where the organs were coming from. But uh, to go to Canada, the CBC has been, the, our national broadcaster has not been uh, very helpful on this. Uh, in your country, uh, in the United States, I think it's fair to say that CNN has been quite helpful. Uh, um, yeah, I would have to say that uh, that your media has not been particularly helpful. The New York Times has covered it, um, but most of your print and your electronic media have not been uh, as helpful as I think they could have been. Let me just add that there was a, an article in the Washington Post two or three years ago, and it was must have been planted. It was written from a very pro-Chinese perspective, criticized the reports up every way to Sunday, um, and then there were rebuttals written by the International Coalition after that. So when you talk about the media here not just being not helpful, they're, they're actively, sometimes they're playing for the other team. You'll see one of the action steps on the um, page, the forced organ harvesting page on Spider and the Fly, the ACAT website. It's suggested that people try to get their local uh, and state elected officials to pass resolutions condemning China for this activity.